You might be getting out and exploring some of the good sites that we were talking about earlier this week, like Rodney, which actually comes full circle because today we're talking with Miss Lolly Rash. She's the executive director for Mississippi Heritage Trust, and they just placed their 10 most endangered historical places in Mississippi's list up for 2021. And you were sharing with me, Miss Lolly, that Rodney, Mississippi, and many of its um, buildings there have been on past list. Yes, we've had both the town of Rodney and the Rodney Presbyterian Church on our list. And we did have a a wonderful photography exhibition as part of our uh, listing this year for 2021. And many of the images that were submitted were of Rodney Baptist Church. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those images where when the river uh, rises and the town floods and this church gets lost in the in the waters. It's very um, a very vo- evocative image of this historic place. Well, and I love that it's coming full circle because I feel like this is part of why you guys put out the 10 most endangered um, list is to bring awareness, to start conversations. And then you inspire groups like what we talked with Miss Mary earlier this week to gather the troops and try to save some of these buildings because they do matter to our to our towns and to our communities here in Mississippi. Okay, if we're listening and maybe we're like Mississippi Heritage Trust, I've heard of that. Maybe I've even seen some of the symbols on buildings. What what exactly do you guys do on a daily basis? Yes, we're, we're a nonprofit organization and our mission is to save and renew places meaningful to Mississippians and their history. So we work on historic preservation, advocacy and education issues all over the state, helping to build awareness and bring support for people who are trying to save the places that matter to their communities. How do, okay, so next would be, how do we identify those particular buildings? Do they have to meet certain criteria? Well, for the 10 Most Endangered Historic Places, we put out a call for nominations. Anyone can send in a nomination for a place that's threatened in their neighborhood or community for a variety of reasons. It may just be slowly being lost to time, or there may be an active intent to tear it down. So we gather those nominations and then pull together a jury of preservationists to review them. And um, they get together and talk for hours about the pros and cons and which ones uh, are most threatened and have an incredible story to tell. Um, And it may be a story of local significance or it may rise to national significance. And from that list of nominations, they choose 10, and we highlight those through the 10 Most Endangered Program to raise awareness about the threats to historic places all throughout the state. Is there anything else that happens with those uh, properties during be, by being on the 10 Most Endangered other than a great PR sort of, uh, you know, campaign, bringing awareness, having these conversations, you know, letting the community know, hey, if we don't act fast, this is no longer going to be a cool benchmark to your town. Uh-huh. Well, the key word there is awareness. It's the starting of the conversation where we say, hey, other people care about this too. Let's come together and figure out how to save it. And your example of uh, Rodney Presbyterian Church is so timely because that was one where we didn't know what was going to happen. If you if you remember from her story, the building was in very poor condition. Mm-hmm. There was a wall that was about to fail. The past owner was not in a position to do anything to to stabilize it and yet this conversation had stalled and so by encouraging the parties to come together come to the table all the disparate groups that cared a lot about this history but weren't talking with each other uh, the listing for Timbest endangered having Mississippi Heritage Trust say hey this is important to a lot of people really sparked that conversation and got Mary Palin's group to come together they acquired ownership, and now look what they're doing. I mean, this place is going to be saved, and it's, it could have been lost. And then she was mentioning, too, Lolly, about some of the other structures around it, which were on private property, which we always encourage people when you go visit Mississippi, visit responsibly and respectfully. She shared with us how to do that. We don't want you on private property um, and getting in trouble. But that opens, too, the, the conversation to maybe more people or investors or people um, that have dream and a vision can feel confidence or feel that nudge to maybe call and find out about these properties and keep that sort of snowball rolling in the, in a positive direction. And who knows, you may see Rodney one day be fully restored, at least up to modern standards, maybe not to historical standards. She mentioned that that can be a little bit, uh, um, you know, expensive. And then it could be a film site. It could be a, a tourist retreat. Listen to me, just forecasting <laughs> see, its future. We're going to put but you, you on that jury it. for sure, Rebecca. <laughs> for well, sure. It, it is exciting, though. I mean, yeah. Rodney is an incredibly evocative place. And if you've not been there, you should go. It's it's really this wonderful time capsule. And, and if you're interested in historic preservation and old buildings, get on the road 
road. It's like you said, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. And just go out and explore. You can go by Windsor Ruins and explore Alcorn. It's right nearby. One of our historic uh, places on our 10 most list this year is at Alcorn State University, Oakland uh, Chapel and the Oakland uh, Co- College Cemetery are both on the 10 most list this year. So there's a lot of history right there. Stop off in Lorman and have some of the best fried chicken you'll ever have. Just get out and explore. Get out and explore. Well, that's one out of 10, Miss Lolly. I know we may not walk through all 10 of them. I know they're up on uh, your website, 10mostms.com, if they want to see them all and explore them all. But some others that sort of stick out for the 2021 list um, would be who for you? Well, I think the one that um, really spoke to me uh, was you need a Blackwell house in Mayersville. And it was because of her story. Uh, Unita was 31 years old when she first attempted to register to vote during Freedom Summer. She was uh, denied three times before she managed to register to vote. But from there, went on to become the mayor of Mayersville and the first African-American woman mayor in Mississippi. Uh, so, I mean, she has this incredibly inspiring story. She she was awarded the um, MacArthur Genius Award for her efforts to solve issues related to um, homelessness and, and home ownership in the Delta. Um, so her house is there still in this little town, both the modern brick house that she built after uh, she had lived in Mayersville, but also this very simple little shotgun house that she and her husband lived in when they were first married. So there are these two sites and some discussion about how do we save these places to tell her story, this very inspiring story about civil rights and social justice in our state and our nation. And um, that one really spoke to me. And so you can read more about it, too, over at 10mostms.com. But what are some of the other ones, uh, Miss Lolly, that stick out that people might be interested in knowing that's in their community or around? Yeah. Well, so we, we make the announcement at a big party. We had a big uh, uh, sh- uh, shindig last night at the Faulkner in Jackson. And I think we probably had about 400 uh, avid preservationists who attended. And one that seemed to get the most reaction from uh, announcing it to this audience was the Jackson Zoo. Uh, There's been a lot of discussion in recent years about what do we do with the zoo, right? Uh, It's in uh, poor repair in many ways. Uh, These wonderful uh, WPA buildings that were built during the Great Depression, uh, you know, they're really special and and magical. And people came up to me after that presentation and said, I remember when, I remember when, right? Well, we need to get a, you know, change that discussion to how can we get involved now? And a lot of the discussion to me, this is a listing about the zoo, but it's also about West Jackson, because you don't take the one good thing away from a neighborhood that's struggling, right? You figure out how to help the neighborhood and make that place, in this case, the Jackson Zoo, be an anchor for redevelopment. What would be some of the possible scenarios, Lolly? I know it's not, you, you can't write out like the solution to all of this. Some of them are much bigger than, you know, one conversation. But but by being on the endangered list, what does this open it up for at least maybe some solutions for the zoo or for, um, you know, the Miss Blackwell's house? Would someone come in and invest in it? Would it be donations? Well, each each site is unique. Right. And they have different solutions. The zoo is a very complicated issue and it's going to take many people and many different groups coming together and saying it's important. We're going to fight for this. Right. We're going to fight for our neighborhood and we're going to fight for our zoo. Uh, You need a Blackwell house. To me, again, the family members, uh, Jeremiah Blackwell, her son was at the event last night. Such a lovely man. And he said it would be you know, tremendous if he could be a part of making this happen to honor his mother. So bringing the groups that care about this issue together, finding the funding, certainly, but, you know, that's a matter of uh, looking under rocks. There's some great grant opportunities right now related to civil rights that we're utilizing with Mississippi Heritage Trust to talk about our freedom houses that were used by civil rights workers during Freedom Summer of 1964. Maybe that could be part of what happens in Mayersville as well. The Um, first part is just having the conversation and bringing it to light. And I think the cool part is when you go through this list or even look on the back, you're the backlog of the list, you go, oh, I know that place. Oh, that's my place. Or you see it and you go, well, why didn't I think about, you know, nominating it? I wondered what somebody was doing with that because we have all all have these sort of buildings and structures in our own communities that 
they are staples there. We don't want to see them go, but if someone doesn't care for them, then, you know, time will, will take its toll, and then it will no longer be part of our history, and we don't want that, and we want you to continue to be part of our conversation. So we've got more with Miss Lolly coming up next here on Good Things. Columbus, we're learning a little bit more behind the scenes of the Mississippi Heritage Trust 2021, 10 Most Endangered Historic Places in Mississippi. We have with us Executive Director Lolly. Lolly, you mentioned you have a team. So one thing I love about this is people across our state are putting in bids for their buildings and their structures and their communities to make it on this list, which first shows a love for that, that um, you know, benchmark or, you know, that landmark, I think is a better way of saying it, that we all use for directions mm-hmm. that has such a history. How do you create the panel that then whittles it down to 10? Because I feel like that would be a really hard job. It to is do. a hard job. Yeah. It's, it's a hard job, but a fun job because we were saying earlier, oh, I remember this place or this place is important. Important. But every year I learn something new. I learn about places that I didn't know about, you know. Um, so our, our jury is uh, a group of preservationists from all over the state. And we approach that in the same way we do with our board. We're looking for diversity on all levels. And this group, we normally get together uh, here in Jackson at the Lowry House, which is our headquarters and was once an endangered site that we saved. Um, but this year we did it via Zoom. And it wasn't quite the same, but we had like You can't a, argue on Zoom <laughs> like you can know. in public. There was no arm, literal arm twisting, only figurative, but uh, we definitely had a pithy discussion and a lot of debate because people, ch- you know, they the jurists get behind a site and they fight for it and it's a lot of fun and we, we have a good time with it, but it's important work too. And I remember one jurist a, a couple um, years back just kept bringing it back, you know, is it important? What is the significance? What is the threat? Because sometimes the history is fantastic, but the threat is um, ephemeral. You know, it's like, what what is really going to happen to this place? And sometimes they say, well, you know, the threat's not imminent. It's, you know, maybe it's not loved the way it should be, but it's not about to go down. So um, we had one uh, site on the list this year. Normally, we sometimes we'll get more than one nomination, but usually it's just one nomination. Well, uh, pretty much everybody in Yazoo City got together and nominated the Triangle Cultural Center. Oh, interesting. So uh, they all showed up at the event last night. I don't know there was anybody left in Yazoo City because they were all at the Faulkner. <laughs> but uh, what a wonderful show of support for this yeah. community resource. It's a place where they have educational programs and museums. So and they're using it. They're using it, but there are a lot of um, deferred maintenance issues that are making it unusable related to uh, leaking roofs, issues with the basement, and, you know, electrical issues. So it's a downward slide, right? And they wanted to say, hey, we care about this place. We want to build support. Uh, the mayor was there. Council people were there. And so for me, that was the listing was a chance for them all to just recommit to say this is an important place in our community. And then and, use it, too, as leverage to have conversations with those that may want to, you know, invest in it or raise funds for absolutely. it. Absolutely. Find the dollars. And I don't know much about the history there of the Culture Center in Yazoo, but I feel like its future is pretty bright if you've got that much buy-in from the community. I think it's going to be one of those good things stories Absolutely. That, you know, and to come up. We want we want people to use this listing, the 10 most listing, as a, like a tool, a weapon. You know, be the first part of the discussion. Our beautiful cultural center ended up on the 10 most list, and we're going to fix that, right? Um, the, if you meet somebody from the Turkey Creek neighborhood of Gulfport, one of the first things that they'll tell you about their neighborhood is, you know we're endangered, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they use that as yeah. a as a way, you know a jumping off point to build support for uh, preservation issues in their community, and you have Gulfport actually on the list. It's the Broadmoor store. Yes, that's one that's had a lot of interest. Uh, it's a wonderful corner store, right? Uh, it's located in between two neighborhoods in Gulfport: the Soria City neighborhood and uh, Broadmoor. And Soria City's been traditionally African-American neighborhood, and Broadmoor is white. And so the nomination, and the jury really felt strongly about this, was that the store was this central meeting place 
for two communities that otherwise didn't have a chance to get together, right? And so it was uh, a place to exchange gossip and visit with neighbors. It was a a neutral space related to race. And so it's been purchased by an African-American businessman, Ronnie uh, Matthew Harris, and he has big plans for redeveloping it to serve that need in the future uh, as a community gathering place for both of these neighborhoods. Which I love that you bring that up to be able to redevelop it because uh, we were talking on Good Things earlier, Lolly, about or with Miss uh, Mary, going back to Rodney, saying that if you want to keep it historically preserved, there are a lot, there is red tape, there's rules, there's regulations to guidelines, depending on what you want to do uh, to keep it with this historic reference. But not all of these buildings have to go through those rigid ways. They could be bought and sort of brought back in a more modern way, but keeping with, you know, the intent of the historical, you know, significance. But it's not always an uphill battle with every... It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be with every... <laughs> but it does sometimes feel like that when you bring up historical preservation, which for good reason, because it's it keeps it in a specific, you know, box and, yeah. and, and keeps uh, certain things alive in it. But, but some of these could be purchased and with the same spirit of what it once was, being able to have the freedom to also put in a little modern flair if you sure. wanted to. Well, uh, most of design review happens at a local level, right? That's going to be your local preservation commission or your uh, your local planning um, body. Uh, and so, you know, for something like the Broadmoor store, the first thing they're going to do is go, go to the city of Gulfport and pull a permit and say, these are the things we want to do. Now, if they decide that they want to go after things like historic tax credits at a state and federal level, that comes with a, another layer of review, right? Because in order to get those credits, you have to conform to the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. It's a carrot and stick situation. You know, you're going to get 25% credit at a state level, a 20% credit at a federal level. Um, and and in return, you're going to restore this building according to the Secretary of, Standard, Secretary of Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation. And that is reviewed by our State Historic Preservation Office, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Which I think, too, is fair. I mean, I think it's also fair when you're talking about these endangered places where you can have a little wiggle room or you can sort of stick to the straight and narrow of how you want it or who the investor uh, wants or how the investors kind of sees it or how the town also sees it. I'm feeling like for, you know, the um, for the center, I think it'll probably stay the same but still be brought up. I would want modern electrical. <laughs> I want modern. <laughs> I want yeah, modern absolutely. Electrical. <laughs> <laughs> and plumbing. Another one that I've actually seen uh, – I've seen the Jackson Zoo, but I've also seen the Temple Theater in Meridian. I've driven by it. I've been walked around it. I guess I didn't realize that maybe um, it was endangered. So what's what's well, going on with the you zoo? Know, with the the, zoo with the jury uh, picked this one. It was nominated, and um, we see it as a preemptive strike, right? Because it's it could potentially be in, endangered. The current um, owner, Roger Smith. Um, he has worked for 12 years to maintain this building, and he's the producer, he's the janitor, he's the handyman, and he's tired, right? <laughs> and he's ready to pass the baton on to someone else. And so at this point, that theater's in flux. And if we don't get a great caretaker, someone who loves it and wants to make sure that it is you know, brought forward and um, maintained and loved, and it's, it continues to be a community asset, we could see a slow uh, decline and lose this one so we're gonna we're gonna get that pr out there and say come on be a part of this success story right there in downtown meridian i can see it's not it's not the theater but Uh, well that meridian is a complicated place right (laughs) we've got our wins and losses there but uh great preservation success story tenmo's uh graduate is the three foot building which is about to reopen as a hotel and that one was not only on our list as a 10 most endangered it was on the national list of 11 most endangered historic places beautiful Art Deco skyscraper, and now it's going to be, you know, it could have gone either way, right? It could have been lost. Right. There were times when they said, we need to tear that old thing down. And now it's going to be this swanky hotel with a rooftop terrace bar. It's a huge preservation success story. And I think there's, a, for everyone on the endangered list, there's a, a success story across our state, too. And I think, again, just having these conversations, if nothing else, if you feel like, well, I'm hopeless in this fight, Rebecca, I don't have the investment funds, I don't 
have, you know, whatever. Well, when you're driving through, at least open your eyes and start asking questions about the buildings you know that aren't occupied anymore or maybe seeing a little bit of decline. Oh, and if you see something like the town of Yazoo comes together, get involved. Yeah, You never absolutely. know, like the more voices that get around something, the more likely somebody's going to say, well, this is worthy of, of saving. And, and the solutions are going to come from different places. And we want to make sure as Mississippi Heritage Trust that every rock has been looked under, that all funding opportunities are explored, and that we get to that preservation success story. Because these structures, they're what make home home. Absolutely. It makes history. it Yazoo City, right? It definitely does. <laughs> well, you've made our day here on Good Things, Lolly. You'll have to keep us updated on any success story that comes from any of the endangered lists. I always think those are good things to share. Where can we go to get the list? At 10mostms.com. Please visit. It's all up there. And we also have this wonderful new story map that maps where these sites are around the state so you can get out and explore. There you go. All righty. Stick with us. we got more for you coming.